Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning and a happy new year. So this is the new, the next lecture, the first lecture in the new year. We also start with a new topic with Gaussian processes, which is also a classic topic in machine learning for certain reasons. So it's an interesting way for Bayesian modeling of functions. So it's an interesting method on the one hand, but everyone wants to do deep learning today, so who cares for these old methods? But they also give quite a bit of um, insight into um, Gaussian distributions and how to generalize Gaussian distributions. So at the same time, you learn something, how to generalize something that you know very well for functions, for example. So it's also theoretically quite interesting how to do it. And at the end, it's also um, increasing the skills that you have. Um, in particular, if you meet people on conferences like uh, Karl Rasmussen or um, some other people who worked a lot on Gaussian processes, so they all know this material. So it's good to know what they know, what the stars know. So it's, it's good to know these topics that are classic. And sometimes people invent a new deep learning method then that is inspired by some idea from Gaussian process. Or people think about, is Gaussian process a special case of deep learning or vice versa. So these questions are all super relevant and interesting. So it's important to learn about them. So we are talking about regression problems here in Gaussian processes. So we are given some data set like this one here. So these are measurements now um, of some where we have some locations x and we have some values y. So just like in the linear regression setting. So the basically the same thing. Um, <coughs> since we are here for Bayesian, we also have these little error bars around our measurements. So we, here we assume that we know the variance of the noise. So that's why there's a little error bar around all these measurements. Yeah, that's very common that people know, physicists sometimes they know what the error bars of, them, of their devices are. And so this knowledge can be used sometimes. And in particular for Bayesian inference, often it, it's essential that you know it sometimes. Or at least that you assume that there is some noise, right? If you assume there is no noise, the true function must go through exactly all those points here, which might not be a good idea, right? So maybe there are some wiggliness that is just due to noise, let's say like this one that is a little bit lower than the neighbors. However, this looks like an edge. This looks like it's going up and then it's going down again. So this more looks like some structure in the data. And so it's interesting to put it into um, the mathematics as well, and not just say we minimize least square and everything is fine, but if you know the noise variance, you can also plug it into, into the mathematics here. Um, so this is all based on the Gaussian distribution. So let's just recall quickly what was the Gaussian distribution. It was the Gaussian dis it was the distribution on the space of vectors, where the scalars are a special case of that one, right? So x could be also from r to the one. But more generally, we looked at the multivariate Gaussian distribution, where our data or our x comes from the r to the m, from some m-dimensional space. And in that case, um, basically, we have two parameters. The mu is the vector coming from the same space. So that's like the center of your data. So the, basically, where is the data in space? And around what location is most of the data? And we have a covariance matrix. Um, sigma, which is telling us about the spread in the different dimensions. And in one dimension, the spread is defined by the standard deviation or by the variance. So it's only one number and it tells us how much the spread of the data is. But in 3D or in 2D, the spread is more complicated because it could be like, it's more looking like an ellipsoid, for example. So it could be different directions. It could have different variances, okay? And that's why we need a whole matrix. However, since it is kind of described symmetrically around this mean here, yeah, we will have a symmetric positive definite matrix. So the symmetry here leads to the fact that at a symmetric positive definite means that the sigma allows us to, to describe an ellipsoid around the, the mean, okay? So the ellipsoidal shapes are exactly described by this sigma here, okay? So that's where it's coming from. However, if the coordinates of the x are independent, then the sigma very often is a diagonal matrix. So that's a very common case. And that basically means visually, uh, we can also draw a picture for that one. Um, so um, in, in general, a 2D ellipse can be anything like this. And there will be 
to describing vectors which are basically encoded by the sigma, yeah, by the sigma matrix. So it could be some squared matrix, symmetric, positive, definite. However, if the ellipse is aligned with the coordinate axis, then the sigma is some diagonal matrix. Yeah, it basically means that the first coordinate and the second coordinate, they are uncorrelated. And if it's Gaussian distributed, then they will be also independent in that case. Okay? And then the axis of the ellipse are aligned with these ones. So you could also view it so um, such a diagonal matrix is telling us kind of the spread in each of these dimensions. And if we have a rotated ellipse, it's like rotating this guy to something more complicated. Okay? It's like rotating such a matrix into more complicated spheres. So that's why we have a, a general symmetric positive definite matrix. Again, why positive definite? That's just a property that covariance matrices have because covariance matrices are typically defined as the outer product of vectors, okay? So they are, if x is a big data set, let's say x1 to xn, where each of the column is one of the data points here, yeah, then the covariance matrix can be written like that, or more precisely, divided by n, or depending on the estimator, n minus 1, or whatever. Yeah? And here you see that um, the sigma is the square of some other matrix, and that is exactly this positivity. OK, okay so far, so good. Um, Gaussian processes, now that also defines a distribution, but now not on the space of vectors, but on the space of functions, okay? So we have some function f from the r to the m to r in this case, and then we write f is distributed according to a GP with two parameters m and k, and where now the mean vector um, is not a vector anymore, but now the mean is a function, okay? So this m is coming from the same space of function as the f in this case, so it must be also a function from r to the m to r, okay? Similarly, we have a covariance function which takes two vectors as inputs, okay? Um, this thing looks really very much like a kernel function in support vector machines, and it really is. So if you recall, the special property for kernel functions for support vector machines um, was that they should be positive definite kernel functions. And positive definite kernel functions are exactly the same as covariance functions. However, there was like in 2000 and then the following 20 years when people working on support vector machines and Gaussian processes, there were like these two fields and um, two branches. Um, so there were like the more frequentist inspired people, okay? And they were working on SVM and it's typically classification, but you can also do SVM regression. And so they are talking about these kernel functions that are positive definite and that come from functional analysis and they are motivated from uh, whatever, generalizing linear algebra to functions, that's functional analysis, and that's where they have these reproducing kernel Hilbert space stuff and all this series, so that's functional analysis. And then there are more the Bayesians, and they are doing something very similar, actually. And they are talking about GP regression, and so that is the natural way to use Gaussian processes, to use it for regression. For support vector machines, the natural way, in my opinion, is to do classification. That's how we motivated it. But there is a variant that can also do regression. And, of course, for GPs, there's also a variant that can do classification. Okay? And both basically use the kernel trick. So they are very related to each other. Okay? One can also interpret the support vector machines in a Bayesian way somehow by cleverly choosing certain prior distributions. Yeah? Um, so somehow they are really closely related. However, this is like the Bayesian formulation often is mathematically very nice, but then when you want to do computations, it can be very painful. The support vector machine had this special feature of finding like a sparse set of support vectors. 
So basically, the description of the final classifier could be done with a very small set of data points. That was the set of support vectors. They were relevant, right? We had this uh, function then f of x, something like summation alpha i k x i comma x, something like that. And the alpha i were only positive or non-zero for the support vectors. And that was something like algorithmically really nice. So it's coming from an algorithmic motivation. And that's coming more from a probabilistic Bayesian motivation. But the two things are very related. However, they are different. So you cannot just translate one into the other. OK. Going back to the slide, I said, OK, we are familiar with the multivariate Gaussian distribution. Next, we generalize it to the space of functions, right? And of course, this must be made more specific. Um, so how can we do it? So the multivariate Gaussian distribution is defined by a PDF, right? So we write down this PDF, and that basically describes the whole distribution, right? So we have a density function, and it kind of tells us how likely it is to see a certain vector. Um, how can we define Gaussian processes? And for that, we are using a construction that is very common in mathematics, and we've seen it already for the definition of positive definiteness. So when you recall, a positive definite function was a function where if you take finitely many data points and plug it into the function, the resulting matrix is positive definite. So we kind of collapse the function onto finitely many data points. And then we use the properties that we know from linear algebra. We do it here exactly the same way. We basically define it in such a way that if we choose some matrix of locations, so we collapse it onto finitely many locations, yeah, then we can define a vector, which we call f sub x in this case, which evaluates a function f on this location. And then we say these vectors should be Gaussian distributed. And what mean vector would be now be natural? Any ideas, any suggestions? So what would be a reasonable mean vector now? So you are given a mean function and a covariance function. So what would be a good vec uh, mean, f mean vector that we could use here for this Gaussian distribution? Any idea? Yes? Exactly. So we evaluate the mean function also at these different locations. And similarly, for the covariance matrix, we, we generate one. So this looks like a large definition here, but it's actually the same pattern that we've seen before when we define positive definite functions. And it's a very common pattern in mathematics when you understand the topic for finite objects like vectors, these kind of things, and you want to generalize it to something more fancy like functions, which are in principle yeah, some infinite entities somehow, right? Because you must store a value for an infinite space of locations. Um, and then you say, however, the important thing is that for any matrix of locations, so this is a quantification of for all. So for any axis that you plug in, yeah, if you collapse it onto finitely many locations, you get a Gaussian distribution. So that's the definition of a Gaussian process. Um, this definition doesn't tell us that there exists a Gaussian process or that a distribution of a Gaussian process is unique, or all these things. So typically, in a mathematics lecture now, we would spend like four sessions proving uniqueness and existence. We don't do this. We are happy with it, because it tells us, OK, we can have pieces of paper where we write something about Gaussian processes. We do some fancy mathematics. And then when we do calculations, we always have finitely many data points, and we just collapse our data onto Gaussian distributions. And we can use some program that can compute some multivariate Gaussian distributions. OK, um, so some interesting questions. What about a d-dimensional multivariate Gaussian? Is it a special case of a Gaussian process? Any ideas? <coughs> Maybe not how we defined it now. But in principle, a vector can be also viewed like a function. Right? So our definition was for r to the m to r functions. But if we stretch that definition and we say, OK, what other functions are interesting? Here's another function that maps basically the finite set 1 to d onto the real numbers. OK, so that is also a function. And so you can see a vector can be seen like a function mapping a finite set onto the real numbers. 
So you see somehow Gaussian processes is more general, okay? And here you could say, okay, what does it mean finitely many locations? It would mean finitely many indices, basically the marginal distributions of the overall distributions, they should be all Gaussian. And that, by the way, is one, I think, one of the properties of the Gaussian distribution, that if you have a 100-dimensional Gaussian distribution and you take any 10-dimensional subset of coordinates, you will have a Gaussian distribution too, okay? So it's kind of compatible. Um, now we can ask <coughs> any set of locations. So if the marginals, so basically taking finitely many in this case, are Gaussians as well, then the answer is yes. So similar like for the um, kernel functions where we had, um, where I said that the input here could be anything. It could be also a, a set of JPEG images of zebra fish, or it could be sound files, or it could be strings, or it could be whatever. When you write down are able to write down a kernel function for it, then you can run a uh, support vector machine on it. Similarly here, <coughs> if we kind of can reasonably define that marginals are Gaussian distributed, then we can use basically anything here, okay? But we need not only the kernel function, we also need the mean function. So we need these two parts. So next step, so we are, we want to do probabilistic inference with Gaussian processes. We studied probabilistic inference already quite a bit. Let's try to use the same scheme and try to derive posterior distributions for Gaussian processes. So here's the general recipe for probabilistic inference again. So we have some story, and the story might come from some domain expert, right? And, and he or she tells you something, how the data was generated, maybe what's the theory behind, what you want to model from this to there, or what's interesting question. And <coughs> then together with the expert, you specify a prior distribution for the unknowns and some likelihood to describe, given that I know the unknowns, how is the data generated, okay? And then we use the Bayesian magic and derive somehow a posterior distribution and possibly also a posterior predictive distribution. Yeah, the posterior is again a distribution over the parameters. Yeah, the prior is a distribution over the parameters. The likelihood is a probability distribution over the observed data given the parameters. The posterior is an updated distribution of the parameters. The posterior predictive distribution is something like the likelihood. It tells you something for a new data point. What is the distribution? What is expected to be observed given that I had some data and some prior distributions? So the posterior predictive distribution basically integrates out the posterior with the parameter, okay? So it's, they are very related here. And that's usually the things that you are interested in. Okay. Let's see how to do this for Gaussian processes. And um, the starting point is we have some data. In this case, x is a vector, r to the m. Later, I think, in my implementation, my m is equal to 1 because it's easier to implement and better to understand it. It's already complicated enough. But in general, we can do it for vector-valued x's. And the output y are just scalars, OK? So our goal is that we want to learn about functions f kind of that, that describes the data very well, yeah? And we want to make predictions for new data points, okay? So we specify a prior. In this case, now we specify the f is coming from a GP with some given mean function and some given covariance function. In GP literature and in GP research, the mean function often is just the zero function, so we assume uh, like a zero mean for the function. However, as you know, um, today's posterior is the prior of tomorrow. The mean function could be something more complicated. So in principle, you could plug in here maybe the, your information that you got from previous experiments, and that is already some mean function, and you can now update it with more data. Now, given that I have such a function f, and if, if it's fixed, so I can say conditioned on a fixed function here, I could say, what is the likelihood of seeing new data? And as usual in regression, we do not model the distribution of the x here. So we only model p of y given x. Yeah, that's very much as we did for the linear regression problem. Um, and we say, OK, if we have a location x and we have a function f, we can calculate its value, which is just f of x, and plug it just into a Gaussian distribution. And then this is the sigma squared, is the 
standard deviation of our measurement noise. So th this sigma square is exactly uh, the error bars in this picture. So this is exactly described by the sigma squared. Okay. And um, so those are our assumptions, our model assumptions. Yeah. And you could argue, is it now a good idea to use this prior or not? However, you will find out the k makes it very flexible and quite nonlinear. So if the covariance function gets really complicated, yeah, then basically the f also gets it can be a very arbitrary, very complicated function, and not at all linear like in linear regression you would expect. But as you know, in linear expression, uh, linear regression, only the parameters are linear. It's not about being linear, being finding a linear function. It's about having a problem with linear parameters. But then when you use basis function like phi of something, you can also have complicated functions with linear regression. The same thing here. <coughs> and as you know, the kernel function is doing something like an inner product of phi of x and some phi of x prime. And so by choosing a complicated k, it's like doing something in the feature space. So there's like similar ideas as we had before. And you can model quite complicated functions. OK. So we have a story, we have specified our assumptions mathematically, and then we can infer the posterior, but the posterior is now a posterior of a function. So they are not, it's not a finite set of parameters, but it is all about functions. And as it turns out, if you do um, yeah, inference with a GP where you have like um, Gaussian measurement noise, then the posterior will be a GP as well but with an updated mean function and with an updated covariance function. So where the sub n now means that we've seen n data points. So with other words, the m up here is kind of an m sub 0 and a k sub 0. Okay. So that's kind of funny that the k is updated as well, right? Because like in the support vector machine, you choose the k once, you take a Gaussian kernel, or that's confusing. Let's say you take a whatever kernel, some, some kernel function, and some, maybe some mean implicitly, and then you just solve the problem and you have predictions for new data points. But in Bayesian inference, we want to have a new distribution of our functions, so we will also get a new covariance function. And let me draw a picture why that might make sense to have something like that. So first task, find the eraser. Ah, okay, I take that one. So um, I can also show it, I will show it similar stuff in, in code later as well. So my starting point is f is distributed according to a GP with some mean function and some covariance function. And I can sample from that one. I can sample functions now from this distribution. And if you do that, for example, for a kernel function that looks like this, k, a, b, e to the minus a minus b squared divided by some parameter h. If you sample, and let's say the, the mean function, mean of a is equal to 0, if you would sample such functions, the functions that you get, they look like this. Or maybe like this. So they are nice and smooth, but wiggly. OK? So I avoided the word for this one. So this is the Gaussian kernel that we know from support vector machines. However, Gaussian processes, Gaussian likelihood, Gaussian kernel, it gets a bit confusing. So in the Bayesian world, this thing is called a squared exponential kernel. So let me write it down, squared exponential. However, this is identical to the Gaussian kernel in SVM. However, this word Gaussian here has nothing to do with Gaussian processes or Gaussian likelihood. It's just a coincidence that this is yet another appearance of e to the minus something. OK? So the Gaussian kernel function is super useful also for Gaussian processes. But there are two Gaussians. So this is only called Gaussian because it looks like a Gaussian. And it might have some motivation from elsewhere. 
In the literature, typically people call it squared exponential, okay? Because we have a squared here. Actually, it's an exponential of a square, um, and not a squared exponential, but whatever. And if you sample from you get these kind of functions. Now you might ask, so what if I change the, the width of that one? Then you get smoother function if you change it, or you get more wiggly function. You might be surprised that you get so complicated function from such a GP, so what does it mean? OK, let's look back to the definition, right? So let's take here a couple of data points, x1 and x2, x3. And then we can calculate the mean function. The mean function is constant 0, OK? Basically meaning the distribution here is basically a Gaussian distribution at this x1 around the mean 0. And the same for x2, the same for x3. The interesting part happens with the covariance matrix. So if you calculate the covariance matrix, then basically um, I'm now getting a 3 by 3 matrix, right? Because I'm having three data points. And an entry is large if the points are close by, OK? If points are close by, a minus b is very small. e to the minus, very small, I think, oh, squared. Um, is equal to 1. So we get some quite small numbers. In, uh, we get a 1 on the diagonal, right? So e to the 0 is equal to 1. And for small numbers, we get some, something which is quite large. So x1 and x2 are close to each other. So we get something maybe 0 0.9 or something, some numbers like that. And what about if I have a larger distance? I'm getting a smaller number. So for example, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And now if you look at this covariance matrix, it tells us x1 and x2 are very correlated, which means they have very similar values, which they have in this function. They also have it in, oh, here's another one, in this function. Those values are very correlated. However, when you're far away, you are not very correlated, so the correlation is very small. So by coincidence, you could have the same value, but you don't have to have it. So if I now fiddle around with these parameters, it's like saying, do I want to have very wiggly functions, which uh, change very quickly, right? If I have these two points here, x1 and x2, and I change the parameter down here, it could be that they don't see each other anymore. So the, the Gaussian kernel doesn't see each other. So they are really far away. And so the function values are not very correlated. However, if I change this value and make it very uh, large, then basically everyone is correlated with everyone, and I'm getting smoother functions. OK? So this is already fun with Gaussians, and we haven't seen any data yet, right? So I just wrote down the prior distribution. Well, OK, I choose a, a kernel function, a mean function, and then we looked at three points and discussed their correlation. And now you see also, so the GP is only telling you how are points correlated with each other, right? And of course, a good assumption is if they are close by, they should have the same value. If they are far away, they can have different values. So it's very flexible. OK, so this is only about GP prior. Great. Let's observe some data. So let's put it over here. So let's take this diagram. And now let's say our data looks like this. OK, those are our observations. This is our x, y, right? And then we could ask, OK, having seen the data, what is now the distribution of my f? And that is then the posterior. And it, as it turns out, one can show that this is also, uh, in this case, it's one to f it's m4 and k4, because we have four data points. And um, we don't have the formulas yet for these functions. Yeah? 
But you can imagine, since everything is Gaussian, there will be a closed form solutions for these two functions in terms of these ones and the data. And what would make sense? Yes, the mean function um, is influenced by this mean function, right? So the default is kind of that I'm zero, so it will be something zero where I haven't seen any data. And then once I've seen data, I probably will go through the data and going back to the mean zero again. Okay, so that is the mean function in this example, M4. What about the kernel function? Yeah, that's interesting. The kernel function is again a function that could tell us for any combination of points that we sample from the x-axis, how are they correlated? Um, however, for these locations, for example, for this area, we know some data points, right? So now we would say that um, the variance for those points should be now quite small. So we could make error bars to this curve here. And the error bars should be small where I have data and large where I don't have data. So now what did I draw? I, draw, I drew something. Basically, I drew here k of x comma x, k4 of x comma x. So I take a single point here, this one for example, and then I can calculate the variance of this point. And since here's one data point, okay, it's reasonably small, the variance over here. Um, however, the further I'm away from my data, the larger the variance gets. Similarly here, where I'm having three data points, the variance is very small. In between, there's some uncertainty here. And then if I'm further away, again, I'm quite large. Yeah? And this kind of shows you that there's information in the K4, which is very interesting. Yeah? Let's say you're doing active learning. Active learning is something where, let's say, you, have, you start with four data points, and then you can choose the next x. Yeah? And that's active learning. So you're not having a fixed data set, but you can ask the next question. So you could ask, I have no information up here. I want to have now my next measurement over there. And maybe then you get some information here, and then the function will adjust. And then you say, I'm really curious about this one. Where exactly is the function? So I want to get a measurement over there. And this information can be drawn from the output of your kernel function. OK, so far so good. This is already the whole story of GPs. OK? Let's get into the details, and let's derive some formulas. Yeah? But this is basically the idea. You start with the GP prior, and you can also sample from it and look at it, and you could say, yeah, this looks reasonable, or this looks more reasonable. Then you see some data, and you infer some posterior GP. OK? By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time, as always. OK, where were we? We wrote this probabilistic inference general recipe. So we have a story. We specify some prior knowledge and some likelihood for the measurement process. And then comes the Bayesian crank that we turn around, and we get a posterior distribution. And we can also derive a posterior predictive distribution, which in our picture basically means, OK, now let's suppose uh, uh, this is my, my location x star. What would be a reasonable distribution for the y star? So y star given x star, given the data, and given our prior. OK? That's the whole story. Now comes the details, OK? And they, they are interesting. Now, how, how can you fill up? How can you take this idea and make something out of it? So in the rest of the lecture, we discuss the parameters of the posterior distribution, OK? So what is the mean function? What is the covariance function that we get afterwards? And also, what is the mean of the posterior predictive distribution and the variance of it, OK? And some more details. And we look at it from different perspectives. So. Let's start with another view. And here I'm following a nice book from um, Karl Rasmussen and um, Chris Williams. So let me see whether I did I. Let's see, can I do a search here? Rasmussen, do I have it linked in my? I don't have it. OK, I will put the link in the, in the chat. So it's a PDF file and a MIT press book. So you can legally download it. It's called Gaussian Processes for Machine Learning. And that's like a, a super reference for everything on Gaussian processes. And 
Here now, let's start with something we know. Let's do Bayesian linear regression, and let's interpret Bayesian linear regression that we know already as a Gaussian process. Okay, so let's take a more abstract view on something that we know already. So in Bayesian linear regression, we typically have a, a distribution over a parameter, right? So we start with a prior distribution on our w. However, in Gaussian, Gaussian processes, we will have distributions over functions. So now let's see how we can connect these two ideas. So in a way, now, if I pick a w from my distribution, yeah, I can define a function f of x being equal to some features phi of x times w, OK? So, and that means f can be now seen as a random function because w is random, OK? So if we pick a random, the, the w is randomly distributed, it's a random variable. So we could also say the f is also a variable, right? I mean, we are computer scientists. That's fine, right? A variable could be also a function. That's just like in functional programming. It's just, that's a different type, right? It's not finitely many numbers. It's now of the type r to the m error r, OK? Like in Haskell or in these kind of languages. So that's fine. So we could say this expression, phi of x times w, is an expression that involves a random variable little w. And so the whole expression, the outcome of the whole expression is random. And it is random for any value x that we plug in. So this defines a random function. OK, so we see that we can naturally view yeah, the set of possibilities for Bayesian linear regression. Yeah, if we don't say the w is a random one, but we say the function is a random one, we could also view that as random process. And it turns out. It is also distributed according to a Gaussian process, yeah, a GP with certain parameters m and k, where I can write down the mean function and the covariance function as follows. It is, excuse me, so the mean function is just phi of x times the mu, where the mu is the parameter that I'm using for my parameter w. And the covariance function is just exactly the one that I'm using where I'm plug in here the sigma, which is the covariance matrix uh, for the w. Often we say the sigma is diagonal, and then this is quite something quite simple. But the sigma could be also something more complicated. And then we also get something more complicated. However, this is, of course, special, right? As you know, in support vector machines, we could just write down anything for k x comma x prime. And if we could prove that it's positive definite, then we can use it for a support vector machine. And that's the way it will be for GPs as well. So not maybe every GP can be written as a Bayesian linear regression. However, every Bayesian linear regression, where we have some prior on a parameter, can be interpreted as a Gaussian process. And of course, this is now not a proof, right? So to prove that this is really the case, we would have to, to prove now that this, so to really show that f is distributed according to a GP here, with these parameters m and k, we now have to say, so what is the distribution of at finitely many locations? So you would have to collapse it to finitely many locations. However, as it turns out, um, the mean function calculated at finitely many locations will give you finitely many parameters, entries of a vector, and I get a matrix of finitely many locations. And then if you go through the inference, it turns out that this is exactly the case, that those are the right Gaussian distributions that come from these parameters. So one can really prove it, and it's actually an, uh, it, it could be an easy exercise. Maybe not super easy, because the GP um, definition is a bit uh, sophisticated. But in principle, it could be proven, right? You would prove it by saying, OK, choose any locations x1 to xn, plug it into the mean, into the k function, and then you have to show that f of x1 to f of xn is distributed according to a certain Gaussian distribution. However, that follows from the assumptions that I'm having here, some Bayesian linear regression. OK? So it can be done. Do you trust me? So some people are nodding. Some people are not. OK, most people are nodding. Good. In general, of course, we don't have to choose this particular form, phi of x times mu, yeah, or phi of x times sigma times phi of x. So we can choose 
any covariance function and any mean functions. And as it turns out, the mean function can be anything. The covariant function must be a positive definite function. Okay. So far, so good. Um, let's again look at um, Bayesian linear regression. Since we see that Bayesian linear re regression is a special case of a GP, let's look at the formulas for the Bayesian linear regression and then try to generalize them to something more fancy, yeah? that is like as general as a GP. So the story is as before, but now we model it as a linear combination of features. That's just the assumption of linear regression. And in this case, we want to learn about the distribution of the parameter w, and we want to learn about the posterior predictive distribution. OK, so far, so good. Um, we specify a prior for our parameters. And this is all about notation. So I'm rewriting this stuff all over again, all over again. And it's just about, OK, now I want to use w star and v star. Maybe I should have chosen here w0 and v0. So that might have been a good choice because it would tell us something that we haven't seen data, right? So that's the prior distribution of the parameter. The likelihood for Bayesian linear regression is the same as the one is for the GP inference that we've seen before. It's just a Gaussian distribution with a certain noise. I think we used the diagonal matrix before. So now by going back to previous lectures or going back to the lecture on Gaussian inference and this Gaussian distribution, uh, we can derive the following functions. So for the parameters, there's a posterior distribution, which is basically where the mean is a, a linear combination of the initial mean, so the w0 kind of, and something that we learn from the data. Okay, and the covariance is basically also the starting covariance combined with some covariance that comes from the data, right? So this is basically telling us for certain locations uh, for certain dimensions, kind of, we maybe might have learned more than for other dimensions. So it's all encoded in this one. And then the funny thing with adding the inverted ones and then inverting again, it's because those are the covariance matrices, not the precision matrices, right? So for the precision matrices, I think it would have been more simple formula. But if you talk about covariance matrix, you first invert it, sum it up, and then you invert it again. So again, if you look at the case for um, the scalar case, I think it was something like this that we've seen before, right? So you had, you need to sum up the variances of the measurement noise and of your data. Or, you know, that was the measurement noise and that was, I think, the prior distribution of your parameter. And then you, you sum it, or is it with a minus sign here? Is it like this? Uh, yeah, I think it's like this, and then without this one. Or which is the same as um, sigma to the minus 2 plus tau minus 2, and then to the minus 1, something like this. So it's the same. So you first invert it. So if you have two large variances, they are very small. You sum them up. If it's still very small, you get again something very large. If one of the variances is very small, Basically, the summation um, is very large, right? Because one is, uh, no, let's, let's be precise. Suppose the tau is, um, tau squared is a very large number, but your measurement is very precise. Then tau inverse is a very small number, but you add it to a large number, OK? So the result is a large number. And then if we invert it, you get a small number. Basically, meaning if you have a precise measurement, then you learn something, right? The variance is going down of your parameters. And that's basically encoded in this weird to the minus something. However, and if you generalize it to matrices, you get exactly this formula over here, OK? Good, so far so good. This is from previous lecture. We just copy it. And we have similarly a posterior predictive distribution for a test point, x star, where we also now have some um, where we plug in here the wn from the posterior of the parameter. Yeah, so the mean of my y star is basically mapping the x star onto the wn, and I have a certain variance, where the variance is a combination of the measurement noise and some previously uh, uh, calculated thing that comes from the covariance matrix over here. Okay? This is all derivable with the knowledge on Gaussian distributions. Yeah? I hope you trust me on it. 
If you don't, very good. Try to do it yourself. Use the formulas from the previous lecture to derive this one or try to extract it because, of course, there might be typos, right? And I'm always interested in uh, removing the typos. But I th it has, I've shown this already to many students and I think I thought about it a lot. So I think it's quite correct. Okay, so far so good. So we did everything now for the linear regression problem. Uh, so there we have basically the posterior distribution of the parameter and we have the posterior predictive distribution. Yeah? So now how do we get from parametric to non-parametric regression models? First of all, what is now this parametric model and non-parametric model? So here's a parametric model for our function f. That is the linear regression one. And it's called parametric because the w is a finite dimensional vector of numbers. Okay? So it's a vector of finitely many numbers are describing my parameters. We typically talk about non-parametric models if my parameters are also functions or also like in a support vector machine where the number of parameters is increasing with the number of data points that I have. Okay? So basically if I don't have finitely many parameters but if the number of parameters is increasing with the data then I'm talking about non-parametric models. So um, do I have another slide on that one? Oh yeah, this one. So, as I said, parametric model means finitely many parameters where parameters are typically numbers, scalars, yeah? like the parameter W in Bayesian linear regression. In a non-parametric model, I'm having infinitely many parameters. Those could be all those possible values for f of x, where x is a real number, or it could be also the parameter vector alpha, which looks finite, but um, depending on the number of data points that I see, the alpha gets larger and larger. So why is that a natural distinction? Because if you want to estimate finitely many numbers and you're seeing more and more data than in the limit of infinitely many data points, ideally you should be pretty sure what these finitely many numbers are. Yeah? So you get infinitely amount of information and then typically you get nice convergence and you can show in many models that, that typical inference procedures give you the, the right numbers on the long run, which means n goes to infinity. However, if the number of parameters is infinite, yeah, that's a whole different story. That's more unclear and you need more advanced mathematics to show some convergence proofs of something, that something is really working. So because the number of parameters is infinite, then infinitely many data points doesn't sound so much anymore, right? So then, okay, of course, if you have infinitely many parameters, of course you need lots of data to really specify them. Um, similarly for the support vector machine, so does it really give us the right solution for n against infinity? That's a more complicated question because the alpha is also increasing in size. So that's why there's a natural distinction between parametric models and non-parametric models. However, for me as a computer scientist, a function is also just a parameter, right? So it could, it's also just an input to another program or something. So this distinction here is more like statistical and it's more about convergence and it's more about like what happens if I see more and more data. And that's a natural distinction. For computer scientists, um, finitely many parameters could also mean, okay, I'm learning finitely many functions, right? But in terms of convergence, or mathematically, it could be really bad, right? Of course, since we are working with computers, everything is finite anyway, right? I mean, this is a finite machine. It's not a real Turing machine. It only has finitely many memory, so you cannot do everything with this computer, right? But you can do all the stuff that fits into memory and that can compute in finite time. But so we are quite finite typically in computer science. Maybe sometimes in our proofs we talk about infinity, but when we concretely implement something, we typically only have finitely many data points. Our program has only a finite length. However, we can have infinite for loops, which we try to avoid. Okay, so that's the distinction between parametric and non-parametric. So let's flip back. The um, Bayesian linear regression is an example of a parametric model in a statistical sense, since we have finitely many numbers that we want to estimate here. However, a GP is an example of a non-parametric model since in principle there are infinitely many scalar parameters. Okay. However, if we look at these ones here, um, 
So um, they are very similar. Yeah? And the, the parametric form here is giving us already some hints that the GP might be also very well behaved and everything is fine. Yeah? But typically the mass with non-parametric stuff is more involved because yeah, how do you integrate out a function f, right? So in Bayesian inference, we, with the summation rule, we want to integrate out parameters. We know it very well for finite scalars or for scalars, finitely many scalars. But here it would mean we need to integrate out um, infinitely many numbers. So we have infinitely many integrals next to each other. And if f is a function from the reals to the reals, the number of integrals next to each other is not countably, but uncountably. So this is really, mathematically, it can be really nasty, right? And it could be really unclear. However, we will only hand wave at these steps in our math, OK? And we'll say everything will be fine. At the end, we want to have an algorithm and get more the ideas of it. OK, so far, so good. So everyone's fine with parametric and non-parametric, maybe, right? OK. By the way, there's a nice book called All of Statistics, which I also like a lot, from Larry Wasserman. Um, and that's a really nice book. Unfortunately, it's quite expensive and not available for free. Um, and I like it a lot. However, I was disappointed. After I bought it, it was like 80 euros. There came another book out from Larry Wasserman. And I thought, hey, that's a book all of statistics, so I only need to buy one. But then came another book saying all of non-parametric statistics. So there was like volume two, which was a bit disappointing that there are two parts of it. But anyway, that's just an anecdote. Both books are really nice and are worth looking at. Um, OK, what's our plan now? Or what have we seen so far? We've seen Bayesian linear regression. And I just throw, threw at you the solutions for the posterior inference and said, it can be all done. We know it all and in principle can derive it. Now we try to massage these formulas to extract the solutions for the GPs in general. OK, so that is our plan. So let's write out our posterior predictive distributions for the simple case. And then let's try to rewrite it cleverly using the mean function and the kernel functions. So basically using something like the kernel trick to get the solution for the general GP setting. And the ideas here or the trick here is very similar to the kernel trick. Okay? So for that, to write it down nicely, we need lots of notation. So this is a horrible slide with lots of notation. However, it's all intuitive. It all makes sense to do it like that. So let's go through it step by step. We are given some data points. That's a simple beginning. And when you look at this, the thing to note is I'm using a capital N here for the number of data points. And I'm using a capital M for the dimensionality of the axis. OK, that's important because now I'm going on, OK, I'm having a function from R to the M, yeah, which is the dimensionality of the axis to R. And we keep in mind, in principle, we use for linear Bayesian regression this form. And that's also the form that we will use now for the write-up. Then we have a generative model, which is our Bayesian linear regression model. So it's the same stuff as before. Um, however, here I use the shortcut phi, which is the big matrix where I plug in the phi of x1, phi of x2, and so on and so forth as column vectors. Okay? So in principle, the phi can be calculated if I know the x. OK, it's just a function. And now comes all the details here. So first of all, our w is also a vector, but it's from the vector space r to the f. So what is now the f? f is the number of parameters that I have. OK, okay why is it not n and m? Ah, because the f depends on my basis function, phi. Right? My basis function could be the identity, or it could be something like x1, comma, x1 times x2, comma, x2 squared, for example, that something like that too. So the dimensionality of my basis function is arbitrary. And so the um, phi is the function that maps vectors r to the m to the vector space r to the f, which matches the number of entries in my w, which is good because I want to multiply the output of my basis function with my parameter vector. OK, so that's why I'm using here an f. Um, next, I'm defining a vector y, which basically contains all the y1 to yn. And that's an r to the n vector. And so on and so forth. The capital phi is the matrix, an f times n matrix. So far, so good. The x is an m times n matrix. And then I have a lambda here, which is basically the measurement noise of my observation in my model 
and that's an n by n matrix. And typically, it's a diagonal matrix here. Yeah. So I'm just saying they are uncorrelated the measurements. Good. So far, so good. Um, I can also say now for a single data point, which could be a new data point x star, I could write out the distribution y of y star of the output. Okay, and it will be something with the same measurement noise. Um, however, the mean will be the output of my function f of x. Okay, where the w here now is given. Okay, so I'm assuming for the y star that I know the w, and then I can have a distribution for the y star. Similarly, I can also write it down for several data points. Then I would say y1 to yn is distributed according to this Gaussian distribution over here. So why am I spelling all of this out? Um, I, will, I will give you the reference for the Rasmussen book. And if you want to read there more details, they are using this kind of notation. Okay? And it's then super useful to have it spelled out once, what, what is what. So here's more notation. Typically, we write a generative model like this. We could say the w is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. The so y given a w is also another Gaussian distribution. Sometimes we also write y given the phi. Okay? And maybe not we write it sometimes like that, but in the books you see it sometimes written given y, and sometimes you see it given x. Okay? But since there's a deterministic function to compute the phi given the x, so it doesn't make a difference if you have something that is computed. Alternatively to this notation, People also like to write p of w is equal to this Gaussian distribution. And here the difference is just that I'm also using this curly n, but I plugged in the variable from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, so stressing that I'm here talking about the density. Okay? It's just a different way to write things up. And similarly, for the joint distribution of y1 to yn, I'm getting a product of lots of Gaussian distributions. Uh, so this is assuming that the lambda is basically a diagonal matrix. <coughs> yeah, well, this is the notation. Sigma square is a scalar, and the i is the identity matrix. So far, so simple. Um, let's draw also a graphical model here for this one. Okay? So what is the graphical model here? We are somehow measuring, or they are determined beforehand, phi 1 to phi n. So those are the locations mapped into our basis space, right? So this is just phi of x1, and so on. And Phi star might be the mapping of some new location where I'm interested in the posterior predictive distribution. Yeah, they are all kind of independent. I'm not specifying any distribution of them. They are drawn in black because they are known. Okay? And for some of the data points, for my data set, I also know the calculated values. Now, this is interesting. In between, I'm evaluating the function f at this location x1. Yeah? which is basically phi of x1 times w, okay? And that is the function value that my model is calculating. Now, why is it different from y1? Because the y1 possibly has added noise on it with variance sigma squared, okay? That's why they are distinguished in here. So the f of x1 is something that I don't know exactly, so that's why it is wide. So it's an unknown, yeah? And the f of x1 depends, of course, on x1 or phi1, and it depends on the parameter w. Similarly, for all the other values here. So this is the graphical model for a simple setup like that one. Okay? So let's try to integrate out the parameter w yeah? So to get the posterior predictive distribution. So let's flip back before we do this. We want to have the distribution of the f star, yeah? but only using then phi 1 to phi n and y1 to y n. And we don't want to have a w in here. Okay? We want to get rid of that one. So for that calculation, um, we first use the product rule and put a new parameter in here. So I just put a w here to the left-hand side of the condition over here, this one. And I integrate it out. Okay? So this is just a summation rule going from the right to the left. Okay, next step. I'm using product rule. OK, if I have a joint distribution of f and w, I can also write f given w and then p of w, yeah, where I keep all the conditions that I have behind this one. And next, I can use my graphical model and cross out some of these. And for that one, now we need to look at the graphical model. So 
Um, how do we do this? Uh, let me let me write it on the board, and then I can refer to that one. So um, let's use this just as scratch paper. So I'm interested in p of f star. Okay, now I should switch maybe, so the people at home can also copy it maybe to some sheet of paper. Given w, phi, and y. So am I missing something? Let's see. Oh yeah, I'm missing the phi star. Okay. Okay, now I want to argue I can cross out some of these guys. So let's try to do it with the graphical model. So I'm interested in the f star, and now I'm saying f star is independent of all of these phi's here, phi 1 to phi n, if I'm observing the w, right? How can we see it? The w is deseparating the f star from each of the phi's, right? So for that, we only need to look at the path, for example, for of phi 1 to f star. The only path is going via the f, then to the w, and then to the f star. And there you see we are not observing the f, so this path is open. Oh, it's independent already, so the f phi 1 and the w are already independent, but the path is, is also already, so it's, oh, but we're observing, ah, we're observing one of the children of the v structure thing. So that was the story with um, the definition of the deseparation. I hope you still recall it. So we have some long path um, of nodes. Let's say a0, a1, on, let's not draw any edges here, a2, and a3, and a whatever, a100. And then such a path is blocked by some set. Yeah, This path, blah. blocked by set S if whoops if one of the following holds and the one case was there exists some index K such that we have the situation a k minus one a k a k plus one or it looks like that or it looks the other way around. So either like that, both into one, both into the other direction. And the a sub k is a member of S. OK, so that was the first possibility to block a, a path. And if all paths between nodes are blocked, they are deseparated. And that implies independence as well. And the alternative was that there exists a k such that a k minus 1 as a, uh, is making a V structure here. Yeah? So that was this situation. And in that case, and a k is not element of S. And neither of its descendants. So none of its descendants. And none of, so I think you can't read it anymore, but it's in the slides. So. A k is not an S and none of its descendants. Yeah? And this is exactly none of its descendants is the case that is relevant here now for us. Because it tells us the path from phi 1 via f via w to f star, it is not blocked at f because one of the descendants is observed. OK? So the, block, the path is open over here. But this is quite non trivial. Luckily, the w is also observed. It's also conditioned on. So the thing up here is blocked. OK? And that's how we see that the f star is deseparated from phi 1 to phi n. And it's also deseparated from y1 to y n. Oops. Which means we can just drop it over here. OK? We can just remove it. Let's look at the next expression, and it says the w and all of these. OK, let's, let's copy it also to the board, and then we can discuss it. So uh, let me just copy it, and then I show you the slides again. Uh, I show you the board. 
So w given phi star, comma phi comma y. And it's about this one. That's the one that we are interested in that we want to remove. Okay. So I just copied this expression for the people watching the video. And now let's see why we can get rid of that one. So the w is separated from, given the phi and the y, the w is separated from the ones. Is it true? Ah, OK. So this is now true, because here we have a v structure. Yeah. So the phi star is independent of everyone else. Okay, but for trivial reasons. It doesn't matter whether I observe the, the no. ah, no, no. Oh, okay, let's, again. So, the, these ones, uh, now I'm confused myself. Okay, so I want to show that phi star is independent of w, given these ones, fine. Phi star is independent of w anyway. Okay, whether I observe others or not, that's irrelevant in this case. Okay, because I'm having here a V structure and I'm not conditioning on the output of F star. Okay, so that is the reason. Fine with everyone? I hope I was the only one confused. Oh, we go on with the slides. Okay, so I can also cross out that one. Okay, translated more into, into in, in intuition. Basically, the w and my location where I'm probing, where I'm testing, they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah? So the distribution of my axes are not specified at all. They are freely choosable. So I can also get rid of that one. OK, and now start the more funny, difficult stuff. So given that I know the w and the phi star, basically the function value is calculatable, and I can compare my f star whether it has exactly that value or not. So here's no randomness. So this is just a delta peak. I could also have written Iverson brackets here. And this is now going into distribution theory, where you have delta functions. And integrating delta functions, um, basically, there are some weird properties. Or well, the weird property of a delta function is this. If you integrate, um, let's say, Oh, let's, let's take the Iverson bracket as a delta function. So if you calculate this integration, and now, oh, OK, maybe we better use the real delta function. So let's use the delta function x minus 17. The delta function is always 0 um, for any value that is non-zero. And if I'm having a 0 value in here, the delta function is something like infinity, something weird. So basically, it means if I integrate the delta function against some other function, I'm evaluating this function f at that location. Yeah? And that is something strange, because the delta function is basically a function which looks like this, going to infinity at, at one location. And if you integrate it against another function, you're evaluating that function. That is kind of cumbersome, and I have no deep, deeper understanding of that one. I think that is the defining property of the delta function. And it's super useful in physics, and it's <coughs> in this case, it's also super useful for us. OK, but let's don't worry too much about it. Um, why am I not putting a Gaussian distribution here? Because the f star is the right value. It's not the measurement or something, but the f star is the exact value evaluated from my true function. So there is no measurement noise. That's why I'm having here this delta peak. However, and then to go on and do this calculation, then a miracle occurs, yeah, and we get a Gaussian distribution at the end out of this one. And this expression, again, looks quite horrible in a way, but it is, again, made exactly like all the other expressions, right? Here we are having. Some, um, some, some initial value kind of from the prior distribution of my parameter w, where the mean mu is the parameter w, basically, the mean of the parameter w. And then this is an expression that I get where I'm having a linear combination of my measurements y, and I'm averaging them in a clever way, yeah, just like in Bayesian linear regression. Okay? And I need to subtract, basically, the mean again. Um, and the variance as well. So those two formulas here, so this mean 
function and this covariance function here, they follow basically from the Gaussian lecture. <coughs> but I think it's not necessary to derive it in a more precise way. I think we should be just happy with that there is this expression. I'm not expecting from anyone that they're able to write out this one. Yeah? I also couldn't do it. I have to look it up on my slides. Yeah? So um, don't worry about memorizing this. It's more about understanding, looking back maybe at the Gaussian stuff where I'm, dis where I'm discussed this formulas like that one, and um, I was arguing that this makes totally sense, blah, blah, blah. And there's a multivariate version of that one as well. And that is basically now using our notation, the multivariate uh, version of that one. However, looking exactly at that one, so this is really a Gaussian distribution, not a GP. Yeah? Note that one first. So this thing here is really a real number. Yeah? It's not a function or something. Similarly, this thing, the, the second expression is really a real number. It's the variance of my, basically of my f star. Okay. Okay. So far, so good. Um, this is the expression that we have, and I derived it only because here we see that the phi is always hitting another phi in an inner product style. Okay. And so now we can replace expressions like phi applied to sigma applied to phi with the kernel function. And we do it all across these things. So here's another expression, phi sigma phi, that is also replaced by a kernel function. This thing is also replaced by a kernel function. And this thing in the back can be also replaced by a kernel function. So our basis functions here only appear always in the same format. Yeah? And so we can apply the kernel trick. What about over here again? This will be the kernel function. The next expression will be the kernel function as well. And then we have another appearance, which is phi transpose mu. And here's another one, phi star transpose mu. However, those will be the mean functions. Okay, So everything can be translated into a nice form. So um, we do this now. First of all, we replace this expression like this one, phi star sigma phi. We replace it by the scalar k sub x star x star. That is a notation where basically it's like k bracket open x star comma x star, but we are avoiding the function yet. Yeah, we are first saying, okay, this is a scalar, so let's use some notation that looks like a scalar. Similarly, over here, that is a row vector, right? Because like it's like calculating all combinations of k of x star with x1, k of x star with x2, and so on and so forth. So that is actually a row vector. Similarly, um, the one with first a capital X and then a little x star, that is a column vector, as spelled out down here. Similarly, we will have the phi transpose sigma times phi. Yeah, and if you remember, the phi was a big data matrix with basis vectors. And if you look at the dimensionality, that will be exactly an n by n matrix in this case. OK, okay so far, so good. Um, yeah, why n by n, by the way? Because yeah, the, the phi on the right-hand side here, for example, how many columns does it have? It has as many columns as there are data points. How many rows does it have? I think it was f. F are the number of rows, n is the number of columns. So if I'm having a product of phi transpose times phi, I'm getting an n by n matrix, just like the kernel matrix in support vector machines. OK, so this is just using clever notation and rewriting the formula in a slightly nicer fashion. And next, we plug in functions for that one. And then kind of we informally derived a formula for the GP inference which is compatible with the Bayesian linear regression. And that will be the solution to the problem. So in general, we could also consider a function m. Yeah? For example, we could evaluate it at location x1. And then we could say m sub x1 is m of x1. Okay? You see the um, notation is very suggestive, what it is. right? Um, similarly, we can do it for a matrix. right? We get a vector. And now we could ask, so if we want to be very general, what properties must m have? m can be any function that's different from the kernel function, which needed to be positive definite. But the mean here can be anything.
However, that's the same as in a Gaussian distribution multivariate. The mean can be any point in space. However, the, the covariance matrix must be positive definite. Yeah, that's the same restriction we have for a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So let's do the same for the kernel function. And I hope this now all comes not as a surprise. We can also consider a function k. And we write the scalar k sub x1, x2 as k applied to x1 and x2, and so on and so forth. So many of these things that I'm showing here are just notation. So we are rewriting the Bayesian linear regression in a, in a, using a kernel trick idea. Properties of k, k sub xx must be a positive semi-definite matrix, and that's exactly what we um, need for our function. So it needs to be positive semi-definite. Also known as a kernel function, also known as a positive definite kernel, also known as a covariance function, also known as a Mercer kernel. So this is exactly the same stuff as in support vector machines. Good, so far so good. What has happened? Let's flip back. We wrote down the, um, we wrote again down the expression for Bayesian linear regression very carefully, yeah, and derived for the posterior predictive distribution the solution using ideally the formulas that we have up in our sleeves from some previous lectures. And then rewriting the answer with clever notation, we can also plug in mean and covariance functions. Okay, so what have we seen? We started with Bayesian linear regression and we said, oh, that's a special case of a Gaussian process. Okay, so assuming a Gaussian prior for the parameter is like saying we have a GP prior for functions. So far, so good. Um, of course, instead of having particular mean functions and kernel functions, we want, actually want to have formulas that are in terms of the prior m and k, right? So we needed to derive the solution for Bayesian linear regression, then massage the formulas as long as possible so that we can plug in some m and some k, and those will be the answers for the GP2. So let's do that. So um, we have now the mean and covariance function, right? So this is now a different notation for the mean and covariance functions. Are we done yet? No, we can also write down the posterior predictive distribution. So, and what is exactly this function form, mn and kn, right? Because that's the one that we might want to implement in our functional programming language. So let's do that. So first of all, the posterior predictive distribution um, can be written as the solution that we had for the f. However, there's an additional sigma squared here. Yeah, so the measurement has some expected slightly larger variance. Of course, the mean is exactly the mean of f of x star, yeah? but um, the variance is increased a little bit because we know the measurement noise. So the mu sub n is exactly the expression that we had before, which is the one from the f star. Okay. However, the sigma n is the expression from the f star plus some measurement noise. Okay, so um, again, I show you the picture, the graphical model. Where is it? Oh, here's the graphical model. So the F star has a certain Gaussian distribution. However, the posterior predictive distribution is about the Y star, which is another node that is not in this plot here. Okay, that's why there are some additional noise on it. Okay, so far so good. And now comes basically the most interesting thing, in my opinion. So now, what is the mean function? What is the covariance function of the posterior GP? This can be also derived from our formula for the F star. And it can be just done by now replacing the vectors and matrices with functions. Yeah? If I do that, I replace the M of X star with the function M of X right? Because I'm not interested in x star anymore, but I'm interested in any location x. And similarly, in the back here, I'm having the function k of little x with capital X, where the output of this one is a row vector. And then I'm having, oh, this one should be 2, a k of x comma x. Um, why didn't I put it in here? So this can be also calculated. Oh, but it's a matrix already. 
So this one is already collapsed. So this one does not depend on the value x that I'm evaluating at. So, and the m sub x is also not depending on my little x. So I'm only changing here all those vectors and matrices where the x star is appearing, because that is the one that should be the input to my function m. Okay? And similarly, I can do it for the expression for the covariance value here. And I get a function, which is that one. So looking at that one, it means I'm starting with the GP prior m and k. Then I'm seeing some data. And then I'm having a new mean function and a new covariance function. And if you look at it, um, the new mean function is basically the value of my initial mean function plus something that I learned from the data. Yeah? And what do I learn from the data? I learned certain values y. And this one is basically taking the linear combination of the values of y, where the weights of these ones are calculated by calculating the similarity of my x with all the data points. So if my x is very dissimilar to my data set x1 to xn, then basically the last expression is 0. And I'm just saying the best guess is m of x. However, if my x is very similar to one of these x's here, it basically means I get a very large value here, and then I'm having a linear combination of the ones that are similar to myself. Okay, So that's basically it. I need to subtract the mean of that one, because it could be that um, here's something wrong in here. And so even initially, I might think m of x is equal to 0, m of x is equal to 7, or something. It could mean that after seeing some data, yeah, I should correct for that one. And so I'm only correcting for the difference between the measurement, the measurement and the actual prediction without seeing data. OK, that sounds a little bit complicated, but it's because those are really the answers to this posterior formula. And also in the Rasmussen book, I think I couldn't find them written like this. So sometimes you see formulas like that that omit the m of x in the front, right? Because many people assume m of x is equal to 0, and then they show you the math. Yeah, And it also, there's no m sub x at the back of the formula because it's 0. Yeah? However, if you really want to implement it like in a functional programming style, and I have it in this Python notebook that I'm going to show you, then you really need the full formula like this. OK, similar reasoning here for the covariance matrix. You start with the covariance without seeing data, and then you reduce that one, so you subtract something from it. OK? And you subtract, basically, the more similar you are to the data set, yeah? the smaller should your variance become. Yeah? So if you are very similar to the data set, then k of x, comma x, capital X is large, s is the one from the right-hand side, and so you subtract something from your current variance. If you are very different from the observed locations, then the back part here is 0, okay? and you just keep the variance that you had before. So it all kind of makes sense. Yeah? Similarly, one could also argue about this expression here, which is basically a Gram-Schmidt-style renormalization, like we had also for the linear regression. Right? Basically, the y's of x that are very similar to each other, so if there are some x in my data set which are very similar, that will produce large entries, off-diagonal entries in my case sub xx in the kernel matrix. And that means I need to reweight these entries accordingly. Otherwise, I would overcount these entries. Okay? So that's where this expression comes from. So far, so good? OK. Uh, I, I close with showing you some online material on GPs. So there are, oh yeah, this is a link to Karl Rasmussen's book. So you can download it from this website here, the full book. And it's a, a very complete description. And if you really want to understand this, it's good to listen to the lecture. But let's say you write your master thesis on GPs or something, then it's also good to look at the GP book. There are also a cu couple of websites. There's something, some websites on kernel functions with a Bayesian twist on it from David Duveneau. So that's a, uh, also from, I think, from UK. He's also from UK. And then there's a nice paper on how to visualize GPs from Philip Hennig. He's a former colleague of mine. And some other nice things that I found. 
There are also some nice online lectures from a previous colleague of mine who's really an expert in this topic. So there's um, from the Machine Learning Summer Schools 2013, there are three very complete lectures on GPs. And this is made for PhD students, but I think if you listen to this lecture, listen to his lecture, and then you have a very thorough understanding of the topic. Um, he also gives nice lectures online in Tübingen now, where he, he is a professor. Um, he has a lecture called Probabilistic Machine Learning, and lectures 9 to 11 are on YouTube. I think the other ones as well, and they are also on GPs. So those three, I guess, are somewhat updated version of those three. Okay? So far, so good. Next time, we look at yet another view of the GP, and next time, we will look at the code, right? As I promised, I want to show you a functional implementation. Yeah, basically, I want to have something. Where is it? So those are the formula from the slides. Maybe they are too small like this. So those are the update formulas. And actually, one can really implement it like that with lambda expressions, which I haven't seen elsewhere. Yeah, I've only seen it here. But it's quite cool, because then you take data update your mean and your covariance function, and then you take more data, update your mean and covariance function, and you can really do real Bayesian inference. In many presentations on GPs, you are starting with a known kernel, some mean function being equal to zero, you observe the data, and then you are done. But I think it's more interesting to have this continuous update thing as well. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for your attention, and I see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. <laughs>